Amen. God is good, isn't he? Hallelujah. Quest. Every say quest. Our spiritual journey from this life into eternal life with Jesus Christ. Amen. We, we can also look at this journey, not just as a journey, but it's also a miraculous journey. Somebody say miraculous. Because at the onset of our walk, on the onset of our path, amen, on the onset of our road, we were in a state of being lost. Amen. Spiritually, it means we were dead. Spiritually, it means we were without hope. So here's the miracle. We're on the road. The road may not be easy. It may not be simple. We may encounter some things, but we're on the road, and that itself is a miracle. Amen. We have a brand new life with a brand new expectations, a brand new hope. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He said, if our gospel is hit. Now, I, I want you to pay attention to this scripture and understand that you're on the road on this journey, on this quest. He said this, he said, if our gospel is hid, it's hid to those that are lost. If I can just pause and take a sail on moment there, you're in church. You're sitting under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. You are hearing the word of God. You are hearing the gospel. And because you're here, and because you're hearing, and because you're responding, the gospel is not hid, amen, and you are not lost. Hallelujah. And he said, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Amen. If, if I can share something with us this morning, amen, I am so glad for myself and for you, amen, that the window blinds of heaven have been opened up for us. I'm glad the light has been shining in, and I'm glad it came through to meet me where I was, amen, and still meets me where I am. Praise God. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, Jesus passed forth from thence. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him, and it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto the disciples, Why eateth your master with the publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. Just prior to this, my wife mentioned this on Wednesday night in prayer meeting. She mentioned about the healing of the man who his friends brought them, brought him to the roof of the house and dropped him down into the room, and Jesus healed the man. And it was shortly after this, a time period right after that miracle. And Jesus is walking along, and he sees this man. His name is Matthew. Amen. And I want to create a story because this story creates a, a, a story, a picture. A journey of, of Matthew, whom later penned this same gospel. The publicans were tax collectors and were, everybody looked down on them. Ordinary taxes, everybody pays taxes, we pay taxes. Land taxes were collected by the Roman officials, but toll taxes were for transporting goods were usually collected by Jews under contract to the Romans. So, so here's Matthew sitting, I would like to picture, sitting in a booth. And at this booth, like a toll booth on the highway, you got to stop and pay your money to go on. These collectors or publicans, were they made a profit. So they weren't doing it for free. They weren't uh, volunteering their time. They, they, they made a profit. According to Jewish culture, these publicans were considered outcasts and, and unbelonging. And so out of the blue, here's, here's out of the blue. Matthew's sitting there doing his daily business collecting the money. I don't know if it was fast or slow, busy or not. I don't know. But he heard something. He heard a voice, amen, thundering out to him. And, and, and he wasn't doing anything to invite himself to anything. He wasn't, you know, please invite me to the party. 
He wasn't sitting there saying, oh, I'm so hungry I can go and eat a horse. He wasn't doing anything to get an invitation. He didn't offer, say, hey, Jesus, if I change my life, you, you know, uh, can you invite me in? No. All he did was he heard the call. And it was this man to whom the beckoning came. It was this man whom the Lord would direct later on to write what we would call the gospel of Matthew, the first gospel of the New Testament. So he went from a publican to a disciple, from a publican to a historian, and a publican to an apostle. Jesus saw him not in the fanfare of being a disciple or an apostle. He saw him as a publican. Jesus called to him and invited him, and he responded. Now, the response was not going back to the house where all the miracles took place. This is to a totally different house. And, and it didn't begin uh, and end on the shoulders of Matthew. Uh, it, was, it was a sequence that, that began here, but it continued right through his whole life. Every one of us is here. I don't care why you're here, or why you think you're here. We are here because the exact same calling that Matthew heard 2,000 years ago, you heard in your spirit. Somewhere, somehow, the Lord has called to you that you are invited into the house where the presence of Jesus Christ is. We who, who are here have responded to the call. We took heed, amen, when we heard our name cry from heaven's portal. We're here today not because of some random event in our lives, but God called us into his presence. When I said this morning about the missions and the reports, none of those people, those 265 people, none of them deserve to be infilled with the Holy Ghost. You and I did not deserve, amen, freedom and liberty in the name of Jesus. We did not. The only thing we did was responded to a simple call. The Lord has called us out of darkness. He has called us out of the deep miry clay. He has called us out of the chaos of the world into a place of light, into a solid foundation, into a peaceful, glorious place. When Jesus saw us where we were, amen, he called out to us, we responded, and he blessed us. Just like the sparrow that the Bible talks about, when it falls, Jesus knows all about it. Amen, he's able to see where we are. He's able to see where we're going. He's able to see what we're lacking. He's able to see the time of need that we're in. And he called us to himself, amen, because he wants to bring pleasure to your spirit. He wants to bring peace to your soul. He wants to bring hope to your life. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. I was dealing with some things the last few weeks, and every time I turn around, these same people, they want something from me. They're, they're offering me the, the, the sky, but then I've got to pay the world. They, their, their motive is not to bless me. The motive is to pull out of me everything that they can. And they try to lure. They try to tempt. They, because that's what they do. The Lord is not here to tempt us, to hurt us, to draw out of us. It's his pleasure. It's his thought. It's his desire to give to you and to give to me his pleasure. It's not his will that any should perish, amen, but that all would come to him. It's not his will that we sink in the dreaded sand of life. It's not his will that we're lost, amen. He reached to us in a lost state, trying to get us to recover, amen, from that state we're in. David wrote this in David, uh, Psalm chapter 40. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. 
He brought me also out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is a man that makes the Lord his trust and respects not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto be numbered. He brought us, everybody say he. He brought us out of the horrible pit. He brought us to out of the miry clay. He set our feet on the solid ground. He established or ordered our steps. He changed a song, amen, that was in our mouth. Remember being lost. Remember in the world how it was, the old rock and roll and the old depressing songs that you sang and the things that were going through, maybe not musically, but the things that were going through your mind, the detrimental things, the sad things, and trouble things. Hey, folks, there's a brand new song, amen, coming out of my heart right now. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. So out of my heart right now is rejoicing, amen, and, and gladness. And there's a new song within. I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, water baptized in Jesus' name. I found a new life. I'm not the man I used to be. I'm changed. I'm not lost. I'm found. I'm not hidden I'm alive hallelujah I've got this precious hope I was without hope but now I've got this precious precious hope why would I not rejoice I don't need to hear about 265 people receiving the Holy Ghost to cause me to be happy but I'm going to be happy over them because I can be happy because where I am now put your hands together folks and clap He said, many, many are your wonderful works that you have done, your thoughts. Now listen to this. He said, David said, your thoughts are towards us. When you go into somewhere to a store to get something you need, your thoughts are on self. When you go visit somebody, your thoughts are on yourself. I hope when I go visit so and so, we have a good, we don't say it, but in deep inside, hope, hope nothing bad comes up. Hope it's all good talk. I, I hope, I hope they have a cup of tea for me. You know, I can, I, Dave, let's get together for a coffee. I, 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 I need a cup of coffee. That, that's what goes through our mind, right? But you know what the Lord says? I, I'm coming into their place. I'm coming into their atmosphere. I'm coming into their presence. And I'm not worried about me. I'm not thinking about what I want. To, this is what I desire. I want to be about them. I want to bless them. How often has the Lord settled into your spirit? You weren't even praying. You, you weren't even seeking God. You weren't even thinking of God. And all of a sudden, something, especially when the negative going on, and all of a sudden, a miracle takes place. Why? Because God knows the miracles needed. I heard a story this morning, just this very morning, that in time of need, God supplied he doesn't wait till it's too late. It's over. It's finished. I mean, he doesn't come too early when you're going to blow it. He gives it to you right the time you need it. Why would he do that? Because he's towards you. His thoughts are not about himself. Hey, I'm the Lord. I can bless so-and-so. And so they're going to rejoice over me. They're going to lift up their hands. They're going to shout my name. He doesn't care about that. What he cares about is a simple need of his people. He sees the need and said, I, my thoughts are towards you. That's why whatever he does, he does it well. I mean, we may not like it. Sister Cynthia coming home from Sudbury yesterday had a low tire. We put hair in it and it's low again. You don't know why that tire is low, but it could save you from an accident today. You don't know. You don't know. 
You don't know. You, you say, you might say, I know all about God and how he works. You don't know about God. He's too high and elevated and great. His ways are much higher than my ways. His thoughts are greater than my thoughts. I think I know. Sometimes I think I know, but I find out. Never knew it all. <laughs> and the more, and, and some of you can attest this, the more we serve him, the less we seem to know. Isn't that the way? I study for 40 years now or 35 years the Bible, and then I open up and see some simple scripture. Whoa, where'd that come from? Or I hear it on my, on my app, and I got to go to my Bible and say, was that ever there? <laughs> Anybody ever do that? Or is that just me? I got to dig my Bible. Hey, is that really, really there? I've read my Bible every year for I don't know how many years. And I never saw that one statement that's just jumping out and grabbing me by the nose and pulling me into it. Why didn't I see it before? Because I didn't, probably didn't need that one until today. His thoughts are toward us. So, so many, so many thoughts towards us that David said you can't even number them. That old song, Count Your Blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Amen. Count your many blessings. See what the Lord has done. You may not have the perfect life, and I'm, I'd like to meet that person who has a perfect life. You may not have what your neighbor has. Amen. You may not be in the place you want to be, but count your blessings and name them one by one. Look what the Lord has done for you. Praise God. Like Matthew, we, we did not start out uh, as the elite that we are. I'm going, to say, I'm going to say it like it is, okay? And I, I, you may disagree with me. You, you may not agree with what I'm going to say, but you've got to take it in the right context and the right spirit. You are the elite. In the eyes of God, you are the apple of his eye. You are his called and chosen people. He's not going to look to there until he looks to here. That tells me something that, that I'm special. In myself, I'm not, but in the eyes of God, I am. I am, and when I say I, you understand I'm saying you also, so don't think it's pride. It's pride on me, it's pride on you, and shame on you. But I'm a child of God. Come on. Let, let, let that settle in. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. I'm a child of God. But we didn't start out here. We didn't start out as the elite, uh, as the elite and the most wanted commodity in the world. There's going to come a day, and people are not there yet. There's going to come a day when people are going to look for you. You're going to be the one sought after. You're going to be the one, hey, when the people are going to come looking because you've got a peace and a joy about you that nobody can understand, but you've got it. In a troubled world, you're the child of God. Amen. In a place of confusion, you stand tall, strong, and, and, and spiritual, and you've got the answer. You're not bragging about it, but you're standing with, with knowing that God is on your side. He is your father, and he is going to back you up and he is backing you up whatever the big bad bully of the world comes at you we've got a heavenly father an advocate a high priest that is there for us in time of need I'm not worried about the P7 kids. Amen. They're learning how to stand for God. Can you imagine those three young girls in middle school starting something? What's going to take place when they're 21 years old or 30 years old? They've got a foundation. A young man that's in, in Ottawa he's facing the school and, and everything. When he comes out of this, there's going to be nothing but a Samson strength in him. Why? Because God's showing him at a young age, I'm here for you. I'm going to take care of you. Mm. Oh, we need to pray for them, folks. They're, they're facing something us old folks have never fought, uh, sought before. In their schools, the pressure. Uh, uh, Gabby? Oh, I got it right. That's a miracle if I get a name right. Believe me. <laughs> you're in your last semester of school. Hey, I mean, you're, you're dealing with things 
that, that I've never seen before in the spiritual realm. That, that, that we have never dealt with and you have to face him. We're praying for you. Why? So you can face him and stand in the name of the Lord because he can become your strength if you want him to. And let me tell you something else while we're talking about young people. Young, and I've said this a, a few times before, but God is dealing with our young people. And giving them things, uh, revelations and understanding and wisdom uh, that we, he never gave to us when we were young. Why is he doing that? Because they're going to need it. And they do need it right now. He didn't give us, a, I said this many times, he didn't give us a book of revelation to understand, amen, in, in, in the times of, of, of church growth. But we need to know what's going to go on in the book of revelations because we're getting so close to the end. And I'll tell you when the full understanding is going to come. Well, like I said last week, when we say goodbye world, goodbye, we look back and say, hey, that book makes sense. <laughs> Not yet. It doesn't make sense yet, but it's coming. So we didn't start off the elite. Jesus saw Matthew sitting at his desk and he said, follow me. Instead of questioning, he followed. Instead of trying to figure things out, oh, this hurts. And I don't know if you're part of this class, but I'm going to be part of this class that I don't like. I'm the type of person I want to figure things out. Anybody, anybody rowing the ship together with me? We've got to figure it out. What's going on? That's all the details. He didn't do that. Instead of questioning, he followed. Instead of trying to figure things out, instead of trying to look for ulterior motive, why? Why me? Matthew simply heeded the call and he followed. There's no big announcement. There's no billboard advertising. There is no radio, TV, or internet advertising. There's a simple call to follow me. And that's the way it is today that Jesus is not in the fanfare business. He is not in the pomp and pageantry. He simply makes a call, follow me. Even outcasts like Matthew, uh, like, like most of us, I, I need some help here. I need, I need, I need some answers. Does that, did anybody ever feel like an outcast? Did you not feel right? But the call for us is simply make a decision and follow him. Whatever road we're on, whatever we're put on, whatever hills and valleys we encounter, whatever trials we face, the outcome is always going to be better than the beginning. The destination is always more precious than the beginning. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, Oh, death, even death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, even the grave, where's your victory? We started this walk, this journey. Amen. We were dead in sin, but Jesus called to us to follow him. And now we can say we found a new life. Death has lost its grip. Death is the worst thing that can happen to anybody is death. Because death is final. It's finished. It's done. You can't do it. You can't go back and change. Oh, you know, uh, now I, I, I wish I learned more so I can go back to school. I wish I had more money. I can stop spending it. I wish I had a new car. I can go buy a car. And all the, but once you hit death, that's it. Death is, fine. I'm not trying to be mean or anything. It's just truth, simple truth. But even death has lost its grip. It has no hold. It's lost its sting. We've not yet arrived, but we've not achieved, but we're getting closer, like I said last week. I mean, we, we can sense a change in the atmosphere. Soon all of our worries, all of our trials are going to be over because we chose to follow. When Jesus said to Matthew to follow him, he led him to the house, into a house. Matthew didn't know what was beyond the door. 
He didn't know what it was going to be like. He didn't know if dinner was going to be ready. He didn't know if they'd make him clean the house. He didn't know. All he knew was this man called Jesus said, follow me. It was a strange phenomenon that took place. The house was filled with publicans and sinners. Wow, isn't that enticing? Get a call to, to a house, and you think, wow, you know, the elite are there, the big people, the big shots. Who, you know, they walk by my, my place, and they paid me to cross this street. No, when he got there, there's other tax collectors. There's other people that didn't fit in. There's other people that were outcasts, that not wanted. Nobody liked them. There's others just like him. He may have been intimidated by the call. He may have been embarrassed or ashamed of himself and where he was. But when he got into the house, and, and, and follow this thought, okay? You're an outcast. And somebody, an elite comes and said, follow me. And you don't know what to expect. And you get there and you find all your friends. <laughs> hey, Joe, how you doing? What are we doing here? I don't know. But this guy over there, you know, the guy with the rope, he said, follow me. So we followed him. We don't know what's going on. I, I, I don't know. There's no scripture on it. So if there's no scripture on something, I can make it up. You've got to believe it. <laughs> but when he saw the house inside, it filled outcasts and unwanted, just like him. See, Jesus has never sought after the famous or, or the fortunate. He's looking and calling for whosoever will. Jesus quoted the prophecy found in Isaiah chapter 61. In Luke chapter 4, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to who? To the rich, to the elite? No, to the poor. He has sent me to heal the, the, the big shots. No, the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the leaders. No, to the captives. Recovering of sight to those that see. Oh, 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 oh. Otis can see 2020. So I'm going to give him better vision than that. Dave can see 19 out of 20. So I'm going to, you know, he's, he can almost perfect. So I'm going to give him blessing because he's so good. No. He said sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are in the whitest sepulcher of the thrones of the world. No, to those that are bruised. Did you know to get a bruise, something's got to happen to your body? Uh, just a thought, simple thought, I know. But poor Sister Carol three weeks ago fell. And the first week she didn't come to church because she was sore and tired, all, all this ailments of being old and beat up. But when she came to church a week and a half after her fall, and you saw, I'm not picking on her, her face was swollen and bruised. Why was it bruised? Because she fell on her head. You don't get a bruise from putting a cotton ball on your, on your arm. You get a bruise when somebody punches you. Or you hit your... Thumb with a hammer like I normally do. That's why I like those nail guns. Just keep my thumb out of the way of the nail. <laughs> and when Jesus said this, he said, I didn't come. I didn't come for the churchgoers. Forgive me. He didn't come for the churchgoers. He didn't come for the elite. He didn't come for those who had no need. He came for the other end of the spectrum. Amen. He came for those who would have been embarrassed of themselves, considered an outcast, even in their own mind, considered an outcast and unwanted. And then he said to these people, 
I'm not only gonna, I'm not only gonna uh, uh, preach to them. I'm not only gonna uh, heal them. I'm not only gonna take care of them, but but I'm gonna preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What he's saying is uh, to those people, I'm gonna begin to minister, and I'm gonna tell them that there's coming a day, uh, Amen. That they're, all their troubles and woes are gonna be taken care of, uh, and all the things they're suffering today is gonna be alleviated. Uh, that there's gonna be a hope at the end of their of their. Uh, on the end of their journey, that one day they're going to come home to me. You see, the elite have it all in the world, don't they? They got their fancy houses. They got their nice cars. They got their big bank accounts. They got all those things. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But their heart is elevated at the same time. And God doesn't look at the bank accounts or the cars or the house. I don't care what you have. But if your heart is with your car, your heart is with your house, your heart is with the bank account, I mean, he's not talking to you. I'm glad. I'm glad for my frailty, my brokenness, my emptiness, my bro being broke. I mean, I, I, I'm glad I'm where I am because now the Lord can minister to me. I want a broken heart. Oh, pastor, you're just saying that. No, I want, because the Bible says that he's looking for somebody who has a broken and contrite spirit, a heart that's twisted and hurting in pieces because he wants to mend us the way he wants to mend us, not the way I want it. I would love for the Lord to drop into, into my home, into my bank account, a million dollar check. How many would like that? Make sure you pay your tithes and your offering and your pledges. But I'm not going to serve God because of that either. I'm going to serve him because his blessings his thoughts towards me are innumerable. Hallelujah. These days are not just these days, but the last days, amen, Joel prophesied, and he said afterward, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Amen, this is a calling. This is a purpose of Jesus coming. This is purpose of ministering. He said, I'm going to come, and I'm going to pour out of my spirit. Not today. This has been poured out 2,000 years ago, but nobody's listening. Why is it people received the Holy Ghost 20 years ago? Why is it they received the Holy Ghost 10 years ago? Because the Holy Ghost was poured out. Why did I come in so, so many years ago? Because uh, I tapped into the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And then you came in because you tapped into something that was already in the air, the outpouring of His Spirit. See, for 2,000 years, the Lord has been calling, beckoning, drawing, pulling. You're not here because of happenstance. You're here because God has called you. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how long you've been serving him. You are not here because you're such good-looking people. You're here because the Spirit spoke to you and said, follow me. But pastor, I've been living for God 30 years and I've got this heritage. I don't care. The Lord doesn't tell you this morning to follow me. You're not going to follow him. Amen. If the Lord doesn't call to your spirit, your heart, you're not going to be here. You're going to walk away. Why? Because that's your carnal nature. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. I've said this so many times lately. I am so glad to be part of the church. I'm glad I heard the call. I'm glad I responded. A part of the people that are cleansed and renewed. I pastor a great people. Did you know, everybody look around at somebody. <laughs> And I want you to say something to them. Tell them you're not perfect. <laughs> Isn't that hard to do? Now, now watch this one. You think that's bad. 
You think that's bad? Watch this. Look at somebody call him a loser. Come on. Tell him you're a loser. Boy, this isn't going so well, is it? We can go on because we are. Oh. Here's another one. Look at them and say, I don't want you. Come on. Come on, folks. I don't want you. You're an outcast. <laughs> but it's true. We are not wanted. We're outcasts. We are nobody. But I'm so glad Jesus loves me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad Jesus saw me. I'm so glad I'm sitting at my desk and he said, Come and follow me. I'm glad I could go into the house and I don't know what's on the other side of the door, but I see outcasts like I'm looking at right now. And I look in the mirror at the same time and I say, I belong with the outcasts. And the Lord says, yeah, you belong with the outcasts, but you belong in my presence because I have called you. I have chosen you. I brought you into the house. I want to minister. I want to pour out my spirit. I want to bless you. I want to give to you. Everything you need, I want to love you. Like you've never been loved before. Can you imagine? No, you don't have to imagine. I'm sorry, I'm going to erase that out. You don't have to imagine because you are living the life of Matthew. What he felt as an outcast. He'd get up and maybe get on the bus to go home. <laughs> aren't, you that, aren't you that outcast? Did you not collect, rip me off? The Jews would look at him and say, you, look at, you, you work for the Romans? Are you, are you that low? Now, I'm going to pull a scripture. I don't even know if it's in my notes. Yeah, we do. I, I, I want you to go in your mind's eye. Matthew gets on the bus going home. And other Jewish men and women are on the bus, and they look at him. They say, you know how low you are? You know how despised you are? You know such a terrible person that, that you're not even, you're working for people? Now, now, get this. You're an employee of people that are not even considered a people. Because Peter wrote this, he said, in time past, you're not a people. Like the Gentiles were not people. Jewish, the Jews didn't even consider them people. How much of an outcast would Matthew be when he's below a people? Sorry, below not even a people. I go home and Mrs. Matthew sitting there, what's the matter, dear? I love you, yeah, but nobody else does. <laughs> oh, honey, come and sit down. I'll rub your shoulder. You know, you've got to change your attitude. I can't because that's who I am. I'm an outcast. I'm not wanted. Nobody wants me. Nobody, nobody wants me. And, and that attitude that he would have, uh, again, punched into his mind, seared into his system. I'm a nobody. And then a voice comes and says, you're nobody, but follow me. Paul speaking to those, to those not inheriting the kingdom of God. He says such, now now writing to the church, because he was talking about those being lost. He said, but such were some of you. And I'm not changing scripture, but I'm going to change scripture. And I'm not going to be talking about some of the lost people, amen, in the Corinthian city that were saved. I'm going to talk to the church, if that's okay. He said all those things about the world. And he says, such were some of you. If you're one of them, would you put your hand up? 
Because that's who you were. You were lost. You were lost. You were lost. You had no hope. You were in darkness. Such were some of you. But now you are washed. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord by the Spirit of our God, not by your actions. Matthew didn't do anything to change. All he did was walk into a room with other publicans and sinners, and all of a sudden the Lord spoke, amen, and changed him and put him on a new road, the same as you and me. You didn't do anything to deserve what God has given to you, but now we sit in the presence of God because of his mercy, his kindness, his his joy, his thrill to come to you and say, follow after me. Same voice led us where we are today. Our travels have changed. Our road has changed. Our direction has changed. Amen. Our destination has changed. Amen. But thanks be to God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, now you are a chosen generation. Can we stand right now? Amen. Read this scripture together now they say now. now now you are a chosen generation now you are a royal priesthood now you're a holy nation now you're a purchaser peculiar people now hey man you can you can show praise of him who's called you out of darkness you weren't always there at one time you were in the darkness you were lost but now you're a child of god mm. Back to Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts. This is the Lord's talking here. He said, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. Brother Otis, I'm going to be transparent and honest. There's times I think I know what the Lord wants. Mm -hmm. And I find out. Didn't come close. This is not Jeremiah talking. This is Jeremiah penning the words that God inspired him to write. And this is the Lord speaking who doesn't make mistakes. He said, I know the thoughts that I have to have toward you. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, you shall go and pray unto me, and I will listen, I will hearken to you. And you shall seek me. Uh, let's go back. Lord says, I know what I've got for you. Coyote, the Lord says to you right now, I know what I want to give to you. I, I know what I have for you. It's in here. And you know, those thoughts are not evil. Those thoughts are good. I got some good things. And when you understand it, when you get over the outcast mindset, and you begin to understand the Lord's got something great for you. He's got something powerful in store for you. When you change your spirit, your attitude, your thinking, you say, Lord, what you have for me is something good, not evil. Watch this. Watch this sequence. He said, when you understand this, at that time, you're going to call on me. Why? Because now you understand the Lord has something powerful for you. Kyle, can I pick on you? I miss you. Come here. I got some good thoughts for you. It's a hug. <laughs> <laughs> when you understand that I love you, when, when you understand that, that I want nothing but good, you're going to change your attitude and you're going to call on me. 
You're going to pray to me, and I'm going to listen to you. I can't, I can't hear you. Oh, God, you just, you don't like me. You hate me because I'm an outcast. No, change your mind. Because the Lord says, when you get this, when you get this understanding and revelation that I want to bless you, it's at that time you're going to call on me, and you're going to go, and you're going to pray, and I'm going to listen to you, and you're going to seek me, and you're going to find me. When you shall search for me with all your heart. I can't search for him with all my heart when my heart's broken because my heart's in pieces. But when I begin healing, and Lord, you've got so much. Oh God, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray, God. I'm going to seek your face. And you're going to hear my cry because, Lord, you healed me, Lord. You brought me out of the miry clay. I'm your child. I'm special. Lord, I'm wanted now. I'm not an outcast. It's at that time. It's at that time that I'm going to begin to seek him and he's going to find be found of you saith the Lord I will turn away your captivity I will gather you from all nations and from all places whether I have driven you saith the Lord I will bring you again to the place where I caused you to be carried away captive in other words I'm going to deliver you I'm going to set you free I'm going to bless you and pour out my spirit come on folks can we rejoice today change our spirit hallelujah he's good Thank you, Jesus. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Transparency. I didn't deserve it. I deserve it as much as you do. <laughs> but he blessed me. And went, Let's come. Let's come this morning. And pray. Seek his face. And get into the mindset, the thought set of God. He's got blessing for you today in Jesus' name.